love and let a big rock star here. We'll go to our show. China's striking capital, at the heart of a blistering economy, is a city full of possibilities. Beijing's bright lights drag people here as if they were insects, hoping to get a piece of what this booming city has to offer. For the boys who make up the band Rustic, this is a place of rock and roll dreams. drifted into Beijing from nearby Hebei province two years ago, and they have no doubt that tomorrow belongs to them. And their songs cover all the big issues. Black drive like crazy. Girls, money, beer, life. It's true that you'll find youthful exuberance anywhere in the world. But in China, when you paddle onto the big wave of life, you're doing so in a country that just doesn't seem to have a reverse gear. And these children of the children of the children of the revolution seem justifiably optimistic that this country will continue to grow economically and offer its people all the rewards that such growth brings. But there are those who are not so sure that China's economy can keep up this pace. Many people believe that we've reached a point in China where we're producing stuff or investing in infrastructure that is not economically viable. That in the future, we're not going to be able to use this stuff and we're still going to have to pay for it. Into the world of unbridled optimism about China's economic future steps Professor Michael Pettis. While others see nothing but improvement here, wherever he goes, he sees imbalance. This former Wall Street banker is now a leading authority on the Chinese economy. And while he's not yet predicting a collapse, he definitely sees trouble ahead for China. In the US, they consume too much. They consume far more than they produce. China has the opposite problem. In China, they produce far more than they consume. And they consume the lowest share of GDP ever recorded. It's not at all practical, it's not logical, and it's not sustainable for such a large economy like China to depend so heavily on foreign demand for its goods. But there's a big debate about how effective that is in a country with a currency regime. Michael Pettis has given up the big bucks to teach economics at China's most prestigious academic establishment, Peking University. I will pay you a thousand kwai next Tuesday. And he has a cautionary message for these leaders of the future. Know, a bit less than a thousand kwai. China needs to buy more of its own stuff and stop trying to sell as much to countries like the United States or it'll face a serious debt crisis. The reputation does get around, people know. You don't have an infinite capacity for borrowing. If the US could borrow infinitely, then we could keep this game going on forever, but it can't. So at some point it has to stop and that stopping means rebalancing. So one way or the other, China will rebalance. It's not an option. If Professor Pettis is right, 
then this is what you might call over capacity. The massive Wai Gaochao shipyard is one of the largest in China. This state-owned company produces a new ship every two weeks. To build these giants of the sea, it relies on a workforce of 20,000 people. And employment stability is the government's number one priority. Companies like this not only dragged China through the world economic crisis, but other countries as well, and in more ways than one. Here, ships like this are being built to carry iron ore to China. In China, that iron ore is turned into steel. Steel is then brought here to make ships, which in turn go back to pick up more iron ore. And around and around goes the economic cycle. But how long will China maintain this same level of demand for the raw materials of other countries? We do have a problem with too many ships, too much steel. At some point you have to sell this stuff, and if you have difficulty selling the stuff, then at some point in the future you're going to write it down and take losses. You're going to have a negative impact. The world economic crisis led to a collapse in international demand for Chinese goods. So China launched a massive $800 billion stimulus package. It brought forward building projects and ordered state-controlled banks to increase loans. Tao Ying is chief engineer at Wai Gaochao Shipyard. He says the problem of overcapacity in his industry is real. He says China, South Korea and Japan produce 100 million tons a year, when the actual demand is only tens of millions, leaving an estimated overcapacity of 60 or 70 million tons. Yet many ship buyers are in Europe and there are now worrying signs emerging in that part of the world. Some say the best example of excess capacity in China is the real estate market. Flashy financial capital Shanghai there's been an explosion in both the number of new properties and also the price of them. There's concern that this is a bubble getting ready to burst. Dominating the new part of town, known as Pudong, is the tallest building in mainland China, the Shanghai World Financial Center. Chinese people call it the bottle opener, and the outlook from its roof is truly something to behold. Nearly half a kilometre above ground, you can see how much money is going into real estate in Shanghai. The view from here would seem to suggest that China's building boom could almost go on forever. The Japanese company Mori Building constructed this giant skyscraper. Well, you can see the very, uh, some of the old uh, buildings. Yeah. In exploring the tower with company spokesman Michiho Kishi, you do get a feeling that you're on top of the world. If I came to this side of the river 20 years ago, what would I have seen here? The only sort of things you were able to see so in this area 20 years ago was a shipyard and there's a dog 
But no towers at all, no tall buildings. Nothing, almost nothing. So it uh, looks like uh, the countryside. In just two decades, a small forest of towers has emerged on Shanghai's east bank. But recently, some developers, tempted by high prices, are said to be building far more than what's needed. What do you think about these predictions of some economists that we have a real estate bubble problem in China? Actually, so uh, it's uh, the, the current situation, uh, I can say, so partially bubble, uh, partially there's a real economy. So I mean, there it is partially a bubble, you think, at the moment? Yes, exactly. So uh, especially the so residential market uh, seems uh, are part of the uh, bubble economy. Uh, because now, so uh, real demand uh, for the people living in Shanghai, so they, uh, they can't afford uh, their residency to buy, especially younger people. The Chinese government is worried and is now bringing in price controls and making loans harder to get. This has reassured people like Michiho Kishi. We are very sure that uh, Shanghai will be the centerpiece of the whole Eastern Asian economy. So uh, uh, we can uh, survive uh, in this market. With its huge commercial clout, Shanghai can get through any crisis like this. But other cities might be on shakier ground. The new city of Kangbashi in Inner Mongolia has been ridiculed by Chinese people as a ghost city. Here there are no traffic jams. You're not likely to bump into people you don't like in the street, or anyone for that matter. There are rows and rows of new apartment blocks. Nearly all of them are empty. and still they keep on building. Yang Xiaogang is a local real estate agent who says he hasn't had any problems selling flats in this area. Yet some say Kang Ba Shi is an example of government policies creating a bubble. Local authorities encourage building work to earn tax revenue. State-owned enterprises are often the developers and can collude to control prices. State-owned banks have been told to hand out the loans and many of these flats have been bought with cash, giving local coal company bosses somewhere to park their riches. They have no intention of living in them. So it's hard to measure if this would-be city can be justified by actual demand, or what might happen to prices when they need to sell later. The centre of town is quite a long way from what you might call bustling. This place is either a bold piece of planning for the future, which is yet to reach fruition, or a very large white elephant. But somebody seems pretty sure that this place will work. The heart of the city has a swag of new public buildings, including a theater, a museum, and a library. All they need now is people. At the beginning period, the U.S. ran a zero balance. Monitoring developments like this is an elite group. This may help increase the interest rates. It's not a normal class. This is known as the Shadow Reserve Bank. 
Why do you think sell that kind of companies share to investors? Can you they act like they are the central bank of China. These 15 students and then a few observers probably know more about central banking and monetary issues than all but you know two or three hundred people in the world that work at central banks. And they have some sort of powers in printing money. You can only join this group when somebody leaves, and even then you have to be voted on. Those earnings can become wealth. Lately, they've been discussing ways in which ordinary households are subsidizing big corporations in China. If my wages are low, that takes income away from me, and it gives income to whoever employs me. If interest rates are low, savers, who are basically the households, ordinary families, ordinary families um, they earn much less on their savings than they should have earned. And that is used to subsidize borrowers, who in the case of China are mostly manufacturers or real estate developers or infrastructure investments. Zhou is one of the cultural jewels of China. Here the ancient gardens and temples of emperors sit beside a modern thriving city. People from all over China come to visit, and many of the locals are quite affluent. But here, like in all Chinese cities, are the working class. We've come to visit some of the locals, to see if they're enjoying the fruits of China's economic success. The theory goes that people in places like this are effectively subsidizing big business. That if you keep a lid on people's living standards, you're also ensuring that the wheels of industry keep turning. Feng De Feng is retired and tops up his pension by fixing people's houses. Shanghai is only two hours drive from here, but Feng De Feng's never been there. In his case, you can see some of the problems that Chinese manufacturers face in trying to sell more goods locally. And all around this area you hear the same stories. Jia Guangsheng describes his life here as crawling and says that without community support he couldn't keep his bike repair stall open. People like Zhao Guangsheng will only start spending on non-essentials if the government provides a better social safety net. The Chinese government keeps the value of its currency low, in part because they want the likes of Xie Yoling and her customers to buy more local goods. But for this you need spare money.
。你没有买房子的安排吗？没有啊。为什么？买不起啊，房子太高啊，价钱太高嘛。我我们不起。老许先。说到刺激，经济刺激。说到最好也要老百姓手里，一般低层的人，老百姓手里要有钱，不是说你是呃呃呃老各个老百姓多有钱，要这么说，是吧？多的人多的钱，人家有呃老百姓钱多的太多，少的太少。And plenty of them do seem to think that things can only get better. 生生活，生活我还乐观，比较高兴的，但是苦苦苦苦苦中苦中乐吧。Back in Beijing, we see another side of our former Wall Street banker Michael Pettis. He runs the band venue D22. It's a bar that specialises in giving unknown bands like Rustic a place to get their start. What's happening in China is something that maybe happens once every hundred years or so. You don't really get too many chances to participate in something like this. It just won't stop being more interesting. <laughs> every year it was more interesting than the last, so it's become very, very difficult to leave. And for Rustic, they've just won the World Battle of the Bands in London, securing prize money, a recording deal, and a tour of Britain. I have a lot of confidence for my future, but I don't know if I can get successful or not, but I will keep doing. That seems to be the motto of the whole country, to just keep on going. And this place does have a remarkable ability to confound the critics, to absorb any potential economic glitches and still charge ahead. The question is, how long can they keep up this pace?